we are getting started. Um, I should remind you, I'm not a statistician. Uh, I'm not an expert in number stuff. I do ethics, regulatory issues, legal issues, that sort of thing. So I'm going to try to emphasize in this talk the main concepts, okay? I'm going to sort of go light on the statistical stuff. Uh, Laura Lee and Paul get to do all the conceptually difficult, complicated things. So I'm going to be giving you, hopefully, some straightforward, simple concepts. Um, we're going to talk about data and safety monitoring during the next hour and a half. Um, in, in many ways, this is a relatively new development in terms of how we monitor and, and pay attention to what is happening in clinical trials. And it's a very important development. And again, the concepts are relatively straightforward. Uh, later today, I'm going to give another talk about what we call in the U.S. Institutional Review Boards, or IRBs, I guess what you call CEPs in Brazil. These are your, your ethics, your research ethics review boards. So one of the major goals in the terms of the talk now is to get you to distinguish the difference between what data and safety monitoring is and what it is that the CEPs are doing because they serve two very, very different purposes. And in particular, the DSMBs or, or the data and safety monitoring plans um, are kind of digging more into the study and are doing more statistical stuff and looking at the nuts and bolts of what is happening in your study and, and the numbers and it really does require statistical expertise that often the CEPs do not have. So they have sort of complementary purposes, but while they overlap, they're somewhat different. And so my basic goal is for you to understand what the data and safety monitoring is about, what the boards that do this do, and again, the big concepts. And to just start you off with just an anecdote in terms of my experience. So in a university in the middle of the U.S., for 10 years, I chaired an IRB, right? You're, you're a CEP. Um, and it was an average university. Uh, we did a fair number of protocols, and a lot of them were multi-center protocols. Protocols that, for example, a drug company is, is testing some new drug, whatever it is. And so it wasn't just done at our facility. It was done at many facilities across the U.S. It could be 20, 50, 100 separate sites where this study is taking place and maybe our site would enroll five people and many other sites would enroll five so you'd have hundreds or thousands of people in the in the study across the u.s and we were one site um, so i was chair of of this cep and as chair you're the one who has the the thrill the privilege if you want to call that of reviewing all these reports that get sent to your institution about all the bad things that are happening to people, what we call adverse events. And they wouldn't be just, again, in our site. It would be all across, okay? So about three times a week, I would be handed this pile of reports from, it would often be 10, 20, 30, you know, trials, and, and it's, it's a huge pile, and each part of this pile for one study might have 20 pages with many, many lines of saying, well, 10 of the people, you know, had this bad thing happen to them, and five had another bad thing happen to them. And so I'm sitting there, and in an hour or two, I'm going through this massive pile of paper. And the bottom line, in terms of what I was doing, was I was just signing at the end of each of these, saying, yes, you sent us this massive amount of information. And basically, I had no clue what to do with any of it, but I was acknowledging it because the way the system worked, the IRBs would get sent all these reports of everything that happened to virtually anybody in the trial anywhere in the U.S. or if the trial was beyond the U.S., anywhere in the world. And, and the bottom line is I didn't know what to do with this and the whole CEP wasn't doing much more. I mean, I was sort of the main person responsible for looking at all this stuff. And again, I'm being very honest. I had no way to make sense of it. There's a reason we have data and safety monitoring, and particularly in the more complicated studies, committees, DSMCs, DSMBs, they are the ones that actually are looking at this stuff. And one of the reasons is because, remember, 
I was one site in a very large trial. To make sense of all these numbers, you have to look at the trial as a whole, and that's why the system over the past several decades has recognized CEPs there are only certain things they could do in terms of running the numbers, in terms of seeing what is happening over time as you know, bad or good or whatever things happen to people in these trials. You need statisticians, you need bodies that are tasked with this and people recognize the IRBs, the CEPs were not qualified to do this. We needed a different type of body and that's what we're going to be talking about okay, in, this, in this talk. We're going to be looking at the various things Okay, so, I mean, this is just an outline of what we're going to be talking about, but we're going to talk about what data and safety monitoring boards are, what they do, um, yeah, so that's basically the heart of it. Um, be aware, a few of your bottom line messages here, any trial that has more than minimal risk, one way or another, you need data and safety monitoring. Okay, one of the distinctions is, there are various ways to do the monitoring. Sometimes you need a very special formal committee or board to do it. In many studies you don't, but as long as the study is more than minimal risk, one way or another you should have some sort of plan to be looking at the sort of things we're talking about, okay? So that's sort of the overall message. So I'm going to start out with a bit on, and Laura Lee actually told you so much about this study, I don't know that I'm going to have a lot more to say about it. Um, but you're already familiar with it. Remember, we had AZT, Zidovudine. We knew it was a very good and powerful drug in terms of treating people who already had HIV. And the question that was on the table was, well, what about pregnant women? Might this drug be useful in preventing or reducing the likelihood that their child would be born with HIV, okay? The woman is already HIV positive. She may not have very bad AIDS at the time, whatever it is, but could we use these drugs to actually reduce the transmission? And, and people came up with this protocol to do this, and what they wanted to look at is both the safety uh, and the efficacy, the sort of things we'd, we'd want to look at in any clinical trial. And you've seen this slide before. Uh, Laura Lee noted this in terms of the design of the study. Um, as a non-statistician, what I find interesting about this slide is going back to what Paul said. I mean, I want to echo some of the themes I see in terms of things you've learned in other parts of the course. Notice how they're giving you all these pieces of information that Paul discussed you know, last time in terms of having to figure out the, the, the sample, you know, the size of how many subjects you need in the trial. You need to know the power. They, they're, they're talking about detecting a 33% reduction in the transmission rate, which basically is, you know, you're going to, when you're designing a study, you have to ask what difference in clinical outcome is relevant here. And here they're saying, okay, we think relevant for us is a 33% drop in in the transmission rate. We would like to cut that by at least a third. If we saw that happen, that would be a really good and, and relevant thing, okay? Notice we have the dropout rate at the end of this slide. Again, all the pieces of information you're gonna have to predict. Some of these will be sort of guesswork, but this was a major study, like any of the studies, like what Paul told you, you're gonna need these pieces of information to design your study, okay? And so they churned all the numbers, they figured out they're gonna need 748 subjects, uh, they began the study in April 1991. Notice they were predicting it would take five years to do the study, so presumably it wouldn't be until 1996 they actually had enrolled everybody, and it might take a bit of time after that to, to run the numbers and see what actually happened. Um, and, and again, notice the, the power rate. We have a, a pretty good power rate here. Um, you know, we have yeah, an 80% chance of sort of hopefully detecting what we want to detect. So this was an important study, as we're going to learn, important studies and risky studies have not just data and safety monitoring plans, this had a data and safety monitoring board, and we'll go into the basics of how these boards operate and what they're doing and that sort of thing. In your protocol, just be aware, for, to do a good job, your protocol should generally be describing how these boards are going to operate and it's going to, one way or another, somewhere in there, you're going to describe various rules for 
based on what happens during the study, sometimes you're gonna have to make decisions. And here we're gonna talk about a decision to end the study early. And, and this is one of the major things these boards do. Various reasons why you might, may wanna end a study early. You may discover bad things are happening to people. The drug is a lot riskier than you thought. It's causing their right arms to fall off. I mean, think of all the bad things that could happen, okay? You could discover um, that it's gonna be really hard to actually get a statistically significant result, no matter how long you do to study, and you may discover this fairly early on, so you're gonna have to think about this, and we'll say more about that. But in this study, one of the issues came up is somewhat rare one, but something that isn't a bad thing. You suddenly discover you're seeing results more compelling than you thought. You thought it would take you five years to see really important statistically significant results, and here they were seeing stuff fairly early on. Okay, so it's telling you the DSMB, it's giving you a hint of the various things that DSMB does. One of the things it does is it monitors safety. Are we seeing too many bad things happening to people? The, the protocol, again, lays this out. So they had a plan. They were gonna meet twice a year to look at safety. Okay, they're already doing that, okay? There were efficacy reviews, okay? A very different thing than safety. Have we, are we gonna be able to show what we wanna show in terms of whether or not this drug works? And they plan to do this after each third of, of these projected uh, infant infections becoming HIV positive. Well, so the first efficacy review took place in February 1994, and you already saw the, the chart, uh, right? Laura Lee told you a lot about this, so you guys are all semi-experts in terms of interpreting these things. Um, this was the first interim analysis. Remember, they were projecting there might be a 30% transmission rate to the infants, right? So about three in every 10 infants would actually become HIV positive. As Laura Lee noted, we often see um, a lower rate in clinical trials because everybody's being very careful and you're getting perhaps better care than usual. Here we saw in the placebo arm about 25, 26% rate, so a little lower than 30% expected. But the most compelling thing when the DSMB was looking at this was, remember, the, in terms of the power and in terms of what they thought clinically significant, they were hoping for perhaps a one-third reduction in the transmission rate. And what do we actually see? 8.3% compared to the 25.5%. So in the active arm, in the Zidovudine arm, we were actually getting a two-thirds reduction. Pretty amazing when they would have been happy with like a one-third reduction. And Laura Lee you know, told you all about the statistics. The p-value is 0 0.00006. Um, and so the issue that arose here, and again, your protocol will sort of spell all this out ahead of time, there are often rules for stopping a trial early because the results are so compelling, okay? And, and just ask ourselves, why are we perhaps doing this in terms of stopping early? A lot of this is the ethics. And as we talk about ethics, notice we're often talking about ethics for different groups. There's the ethics of what about the people in the study? Is it okay to continue to have them in the study as opposed to thinking, well, gee, maybe we know so much now it is inappropriate to actually continue to have them in the trial and be on maybe the placebo arm? Then don't lose sight of there's another group out there, namely the rest of everybody out there, all these other moms out there who may be HIV positive. And what about kind of at some point if we stop this study and say we've concluded something, notice we've now perhaps earlier announced to the rest of the world that, hey, we now know something we didn't know before, that this stuff works. And, and so that's basically what happened in this trial. Um, again, the graph is quite compelling. Um, so what happened is the DSMB recommended stopping the trial early, stopping the trial early because they had shown what they wanted to show. Um, and everybody sort of agreed, because usually DSMBs only recommend things. Now, having said that, I know we were talking with Laura Lee, it was giving examples in which a DSMB recommended something and the sponsor of the trial We'll get back to other scenarios. A DSMB may recommend something that a sponsor doesn't like. The sponsor may be going to 
is going to lose a lot of money and not going to have a drug approved based on the DSMB recommendation. Sometimes DSMB recommendations will not be followed, but my sense is that's relatively rare. DSMBs, again, although they only make recommendations, they're very, very important bodies. And if you're going to ignore what a DSMB said as a sponsor or whoever, you better be very secure in why you're doing that because certainly in the U.S. this may lead to your being sued or something. Uh, they're given a huge amount of respect and again a lot of importance to what they, they do. Um, so what happened was again they stopped this trial, everybody agreed, the results merited stopping it uh, and, and national guidelines in the U.S. were changed to say we should in fact use the Dilvedine to treat pregnant women to pr who are HIV positive to prevent this transmission. Um, the other message I want to note here, and we'll see more of this later on, is there was a reason, it was significant, that that p-value was so, so, so small. So the thing we'll talk about is you couldn't just use the 0.05 p-value, even if that was the general p-value that you would find acceptable at the end of the study. If we're going to end this study earlier, and again, we're not going to worry about the statistics. Laura Lee has told you some about that. But the bottom line is you have to do different statistical analyses to end the study early. And probably this makes sense, OK? You haven't gotten as many subjects yet. You haven't run the whole study that your original numbers planned. You you're stopping early, you're going to have to have a really compelling p-value. Again, there are statistics that do this, but be aware of that. You can't just say, we've hit the 0.05 p-value after three months, end of study, we've proved what we have to prove, okay? Oh, and, and if people want to kind of, you know, raise your hand and, and you have questions in the middle of this, uh, feel free to do that. Okay. So let's get into sort of the, the, the basics and the sort of the main themes here. And we've already talked about this, okay. Oh, we have a question, okay. The, In English, right, yes, Giselle, okay. Thank you. Uh, you said the, the DMC recommended stopping the trial, right. but who decides? Who decides? Oh, uh, usually the sponsor probably you know, the, the sponsor, depending on what type of trial it is. You don't have, uh, like, a director committee or something like that that could make decisions uh, based on the DMC recommendation or something like that? No. Well, the DMC is effectively working for the sponsor of the trial. It's the, tri the, the, the group that is running the trial that put it together, which would, I guess in this case, was it NIH that was doing that? Yeah, Laura Lee may want to say more. So in this case, actually, yes, the information went back to the National Institute on Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH and also to our counterparts in France. And they made the final decision after they, you know, the request went to double check the data, make sure all the data was clean, and, and evaluate if there was anything else that could be causing those results. But ultimately, and the DSMB had agreed with that, um, but ultimately the decision is made by the study sponsor and then they inform the PI of that decision. It can be set up a little bit differently on different studies, but that's usually the way that it is set up. Yeah, I mean, and basically you, have, you do have some group that's running the study, and usually it's the entity that is actually paying for the study. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are, it's trickier, I guess, in terms of NIH, but yeah. another example, imagine it was a drug company. I mean, mm -hmm. the drug company may have spent hundreds of millions of dollars developing this drug. Okay, yes, this group is saying, hey, this is too dangerous, stop mm -hmm. it. But it's ultimately their well, call, whether or not others might get involved if they're making a decision that's very And I, I will say, actually, in that situation, going back to the tribal leaders that were involved that had agreed to the study in the first place, they also were part of that decision-making process. But yeah, it, it varies by study. But usually it's whoever kind of decided to start the study is ultimately receiving this recommendation to stop a study. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it clearly, again, this is a big decision. It's complicated. Uh, you certainly, I, I agree with you, you want as much input as possible from lots of smart people, and presumably the groups doing this, the sponsors would do that. Again, I think the bottom line is you rarely are going to reject a well-thought-out 
DSMB recommendation. That would be a very scary thing for a sponsor to do. Uh, but obviously, as we'll see, these can, this was a pretty clear decision compared to others. We will talk about some trials, and, and maybe you guys want to raise them, where it's far less clear. And uh, to give you one of the examples on the flip side in terms of, and this may partly relate to trial design, there was a fairly famous trial involving looking at ways to treat breast cancer. And the DSMB ultimately stopped the trial because of, again, efficacy issues that they thought they proved what they had to prove. And maybe the part that people thought about was more a design element that they should have figured out early on. But what they were demonstrating in the trial was that this particular treatment, again, in the randomized trial, was substantially shrinking the tumors, okay? So you were seeing the reduction in the tumor base, but when they stopped the trial, they actually didn't have very good evidence on whether or not the women actually live longer. And so this became very controversial. You already had the trial going. Had you kept it going a little longer, you might have actually reached a point where you actually could tell women, if you get this treatment, and you have breast cancer, you'll live longer. They weren't able to do that at that point, and there was a huge debate. You know, they stopped the trial. They said, well, we already know it's gonna to shrink to tumors. It is inappropriate for those other women in the placebo, or whatever they were getting, the alternative treatment arm, and it's inappropriate for the women outside not to know this good piece of information. But then we're back to kind of, what did you actually learn? Did you learn the most important piece of information? So this is an issue of using a, what they call a surrogate marker. We, we really don't care that much about whether the tumor shrank. What we ultimately care is what does this mean for the health of the woman? You may be sitting there with a smaller tumor, but it could be, it will just grow faster six months from now instead of now, and you'll die at the same point. So the, just get a sense of these are huge decisions. There's a lot at stake, and we'll see a lot more in the talk about this. Okay, so this, is, this slide is just giving you some of the various aspects we already said in terms of what these entities do. Um, oh, you have a question? Sure. É, só para compartilhar é, informações e experiências, né, eu gostaria de fazer um, um comentário. Great. Eu trabalho na Fiocruz de Minas Gerais, no Centro de Pesquisas René Rachu, especificamente num projeto de fase 1 para uma vacina contra a ancilostomíase. E tem um patrocínio externo, enfim. E no nosso projeto, a gente realmente dá uma extrema importância para o Comitê de Monitoramento de Segurança, que nem sempre ele tem essa função de só falar se o estudo precisa ser interrompido ou não. Mas, ao contrário, como trata-se de vacina, e a questão da segurança no, no ensaio clínico fase 1 é de extrema importância, são eles que... É, ao longo do estudo, há três ou quatro reuniões do Comitê de Monitoramento de Segurança junto com o pesquisador principal, no qual eles analisam os dados coletados durante um tempo determinado e aí eles vão avaliar se nós podemos dar continuidade ao estudo. Ok, os dados estão seguros, a, a, né, está dentro do, do previsto no protocolo, etc. E tal, então, vocês terão a segurança, podem prosseguir por mais seis meses, né? E, e, e por aí vai. Então, realmente, é, não não são decisões unilaterais, né? Essas reuniões, o comitê ele tem um grupo, ele recebe todos os dados clínicos, estatísticos daquele tempo determinado, analisam previamente e essa reunião ela acontece em conjunto com o pesquisador principal do estudo. Então, todas as dúvidas, esclarecimentos e ponderações são feitas naquela reunião. Depois, eles é, fazem realmente um relatório no qual, em senso comum, foi tomada a devida decisão de interromper ou não, de continuar a caminhar com segurança. E todas essas decisões que são ocorridas nos tempos determinados são comunicadas ao Comitê de Ética em Pesquisa da instituição, que também acompanha e dá o... Ele não vai aprovar, né? porque não cabe a ele, mas ele dá uma carta de ciência de que, ok, estou ciente de que o seu estudo está caminhando com a segurança e que vocês estão né, é, tendo esse, esse respaldo do comitê de monitoramento. Então, para estudos fase 1, 
Principalmente, é, eles são de extrema importância, sim. Thanks for for your experience. Yeah. And, and again, absolutely. Again, these are sort of everybody thinking together. Again, this this committee may be analyzing. And for example, in phase one trials, you often may not actually have a, a, a an actual committee. You may just have some sort of other plan because. Generally, you know, it depends. It depends on the more advanced phase two, phase three, more complicated studies. There are different ways of analyzing it. But absolutely, none of this is to suggest that some group is arbitrarily making a decision. The goal in all of this is to be thoughtful, to apply appropriate statistical techniques, to make sure you've collected the appropriate information, you analyze everything, and then you make a decision about kind of, and in general, again, most of the time you're going to go forward. It's not like all the time these, again, it's a big deal to actually, well, to end a trial early because of efficacy being proven early, or even to end it in terms of other things, futility. Um, okay, so let me move on a little bit. Okay, so you want to, what does the DSMB do, or data safety monitoring, you know, you know, plan, you want to pick up safety concerns early, I, logistical problems, it's talking about how good are you enrolling subjects, what has been happening, have, you, have the people running this study been doing the right thing in terms of moving it along, uh, is it feasible, again we'll talk about ending early, uh, have, has, should it be terminated early, okay, so we all sort of discussed this. Unfortunately, we've discussed a lot of things here. This is sort of logistics stuff, again, just spelling out how good are you in terms of enrolling people, uh, are you complying with a protocol, all the good things you want to happen in your study, and, you know, data and safety monitoring involves looking at all of that. Um, okay, outcomes. So in terms of outcomes, uh, you want to look at adverse events. We'll see there are a bunch of slides in here that probably tell you more than you want to know about adverse events. An important thing is sort of a theme you've heard from Laura Lee earlier is you want to record as much data as possible. And in these studies, you pretty much want to record anything bad that happens to anybody. We'll see there are some regulatory rules about serious adverse events, and certainly in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration, if you're doing a trial subject to their oversight, wants in particular certain serious adverse events have to be reported. But in most trials, you cannot record just serious ones. I mean, the fact that a drug causes, you know, a, a stomach ache in lots of people, that's probably something that people want to know about. It may not be that horrible or that bad, but it's certainly going to be relevant to whether or not, you know, that people want to take that drug, particularly if it's a treatment for a condition that isn't all that bad, okay? So adverse event reporting is sort of a big deal. Um, okay, so we have an example here. Consort is your consolidated standards of reporting trials. It's sort of a very prominent uniform system for how you report information about trials. And this is showing you some of that information about how good a job are you doing in terms of enrolling subjects, uh, not losing subjects, that sort of thing. Just sort of a uniform way to present the data, the sort of way data will be presented to various DSMBs or as part of the data monitoring plans. I think we have a few slides that are just showing you examples of forms. Again, these are just forms in terms of how you collect the information and report it. Uh, this is just, you know, various types of data on the background of your subjects and what's going on with them. Again, just a way of reporting it. Um, okay, so here we're getting into serious adverse events. Again, I suspect in Brazil, as in U.S., there may be more regulatory criteria for certain types of serious events, that, adverse events that have to be reported. But the bottom line, remember when I was telling you I'm sitting there three times a week going through these piles of data, these are all the piles of adverse events. In general, the people running studies err on the side of reporting almost anything bad that happens to anybody because you never know if you start, if you don't report it, if you don't do the analysis, you don't know that we're seeing a, an unexpectedly high, you may think this drug already causes stomach aches, but you may be discovering it's having two or three times the rate you thought. You're not going to pick that up unless somebody is looking at the actual, all those adverse events, even the non-serious ones. 
But again, as a regulatory matter, serious ones are often the ones that your regulatory authorities will require you to report. Here's one of the definitions of serious adverse events that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in the U.S. uses. And, and notice a lot of these things probably make sense to you, that these would be viewed as serious. If, if there's death, something that threatens your life, if you're hospitalized or you're you're already in a hospital, but you can end up staying there longer. All of these things are considered serious. Uh, persistent, significant disability. Um, again, common sort of sense stuff that we would all agree these are sort of serious things. Um, again, this is just some more talking about the US FDA definition. Um, so bottom line, of course, you want to report adverse events and be aware of which ones are serious. Um, yeah, this is just giving you information on kind of how you report it. And, and this is just a summary of what you might see in a particular report, okay? So it's talking about infections and it's talking about different types. Is it in your stomach? Is it in your nose? Is it in your urinary system? And it's sort of telling you, are they mild? Are they moderate? The, the goal in all of this is to get good information. The better information you report, the better you get able to figure out how this thing works. Um, yeah, this is just discussing different ways you could categorize the severity of your adverse event. And again, we already saw, okay, it could be severe, it could be moderate, uh, different sort of things. Uh, an important point, um, generally it isn't for the people running the study, you know, the nurses, the doctors, the clinicians, whatever it is, to try to guess which adverse events are or are not related to the medical treatment, you know, whatever you're getting if you're in the interventional arm, okay? Basically, you report the adverse events. You want to collect them all. It's very, very hard to figure out for any specific adverse event, was this caused by the drug or not caused by the drug? As long as it happens while they're on the drug, the general assumption is report it. And then you can do the statistical analysis analysis and perhaps more sophisticated stuff, but bottom line, collect the data, report it. If you don't report it, you're not going to know what happened, okay? So it's not for the people running the study to say, oh, you know, we got 50 reports of people having stomach aches this month, but, you know, we're going to assume it had nothing to do with a drug because in the past this drug didn't cause stomach aches. Very bad to do that. You report them, you're sort of assuming this is information you're going to want to analyze. Okay, so this is the broad definition. It's showing you how broad it is. What is an adverse event? And basically, any bad thing that happens to somebody if it's temporally associated. So basically, it's happening while you're you know, in the study. Then basically, let's assume for the time being that it may have something to do with what your treatment is in the study. Uh, yeah, so just discussing some of the information you, you, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, statistical concern, okay, so this is raising the point we looked at earlier, and I'll say more about it again. I'll give you a good common sense example. If, if you're going to keep looking at the study to see whether or not you've reached a .05 level in terms of proving efficacy, that is not going to work statistically, okay? The only way it works is the starting point that if you wait until the end of the study, then you could look at your .05 value. But if you're going to look earlier than that, you're going to need a more sophisticated analysis. And to stop the study, because you think you've proven what you wanted to prove at the appropriate alpha level, you're basically going to need something stricter than 0.05. And there are various wonderful ways smart statisticians have figured out to do this. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of just hint at this at the end. Of course, the key to all of this, sort of the way I look at it, and you've already heard this, is for these things you call your statisticians, okay? They're the ones who know how to do this stuff, but you have to know when you have to call them, and you have to recognize you yourself aren't going to be sitting there looking for the .05 value one month into what you thought was a five-year study, and you say, wow, it's at .05, I'm going to stop the study. Nuh-uh, this is more complicated. You need to talk to your statisticians, and you're probably not going to be able to, to stop your study. Okay. A um, few slides here about the boards. Now, remember, for some studies, you may not need a board. You could have just some sort of other way to monitor data and safety. 
Um, for a lot of studies, you will need a board, and we'll say a little bit about when you need a board. But to be honest, a lot of these rules are kind of vague, and it probably depends on who your sponsor is, who's giving you money. They may have strict rules. Some groups have strict rules. Some groups have looser rules. Um, but assuming you do have a board, let me just tell you a little bit about kind of how it functions. Uh, in general, the board can when it meets. Uh, there are three aspects of the meeting. The first part would be very open. Anybody could kind of come in and hear what's being said, okay? And it will give you a lot of the data about, well, we've enrolled so many subjects. All of this is very public information. Everybody could hear it. Then at some point, the board is going to get into the closed session. And this is getting to the heart of the special reasons why we have these boards. Because remember, well, it doesn't always have to be this case, but in many of these studies, they're double-blinded studies, okay? We don't want too many people to know what's happening because that could affect how the study is conducted. It could cause bias and, and bad things, okay? So in the closed session, um, which will only include the members of the DSMB and the few people who have actually been doing this, the running the numbers and collecting all the information and who are actually seeing, so this could be the, the lead statistician on the study, who is actually seeing who was randomized to what, and he, will, he or she will give those results to the board. Because remember, you're going to have to unblind some group to do this interim analysis to actually figure out, well, are we seeing too many adverse events in one group or the other, or can we prove efficacy? You have to unblind. You have to actually run the numbers. And this occurs in this closed session, okay? And... Um, We'll say more about that, but the theme we're going to discover is it is really, really important that this be closed. Um, and, and think about it. Um, this is one of the more compelling things, but, but I'm just sort of telling you ahead of time. If this information became public, not only could this bias the researchers, it could have huge consequences in terms of whether or not people want to stay in this trial. Because remember, the goal of the trial is to reach a certain statistically significant result. But you may not have reached that result. You may be close to it, but it could be incredibly clear that one arm is never going to be shown better than the other arm. And if you're in the trial and you learn that, you're not going to want to stay in the trial if you have a very bad, serious disease and you kind of know, I'm in the arm that's not going to be proven, you know, to be better. So, so that's the closed session. And then finally, you would have an executive session and basically you would kick out the statistician, sad thing to do, whatever it is, but you only have the voting members of the DSMB and they're then, then going to decide what are we going to do? Studies going fine, we're going to just continue it, which is often a, a determination. They may, you know, determine we want to, too risky, we, we we're going to recommend shutting it down, or they may send the efficacy is huge, we've already proven it, let's, let's terminate it early. Um, so that's how a DSMB operates. This is just showing all the various groups that could be involved in data and safety monitoring, okay? In many more complicated, riskier trials, we will have the board, the fourth item here. But there can be also others who are doing part of this job. The CEPs, right, the ethics committee, the sponsor, regulatory agencies may be involved, safety monitors, so lots of, lots of different groups that may be involved here, and just be aware of that, okay? There's some degree of overlap in terms of who's doing what. Um, we've already had some discussion of this. How do you create a committee? Uh, generally, the study sponsor is often gonna play a major role in deciding when we need the committee, uh, how we put together, very important to note, we often have a diverse group of people on this committee. It's not just 100% statisticians, though that certainly would be a wonderful thing to have all these wonderful statisticians there. But of course, we need, we need ethics people often. Uh, we often have subject advocates, somebody who speaks for the subjects and kind of is their voice. Um, clinicians. You know, um, lots of different people. It's good to have a, a diverse membership. Um, right, okay. So, 
Um, okay, why do we have the DSMBs? And this is sort of re-emphasizing what we've sort of gone through. You want regular and systematic monitoring throughout the trial. You don't want to be surprised at the end. If there are reasons to do something sooner, to change the trial, you want to know that sooner rather than later. You want something objective, okay? So particularly when we're talking about the board, one of the main themes of the boards is that it is objective and it is independent. And we will see other slides about that. You don't want to sponsor calling all the shots, okay? Because the sponsor has a conflict of interest. Imagine, you know, we talked about the different roles different bodies would have, their different interests. If you've spent $100 million developing this new drug, you're not going to want somebody telling you, oh, it's not going to work, let's give up on it, okay? Um, so if the, the sponsor had control of, of, of all the DSMB decisions and it's a big pharma company, that's probably not a good thing. So we'll see. We want independent members of these, these DSMBs. We want them to be objective. Um, this is just a definition uh, of what a DSMB is, and notice the key point here, it should be independent experts. I'm gonna review the trial to ensure patient safety and validity and scientific merit of the trial. Again, we're looking for the well-being of the people in the trial, and we want ultimately the, the data that this trial generates to be valid and, and significant because we may be changing how we treat people based on the outcome of this. Um, so this is getting into the theme of when do we need a board as opposed to just a plan, um, and we'll see more about this. Certain trials definitely should have a formal DSMB. Uh, the membership should be multidisciplinary. There should be a charter. You want to write all this stuff out. We've already heard about that in terms of stuff in the prior days. Um, no conflicts of interest. So we'll talk a little more about that. You don't want people who are, you know, working for the drug company and getting money from them or who are, who are enrolling people in this trial. That's generally not a good thing. That's somewhat conflicted. And again, the interim data should be considered to be highly confidential. We only reveal that in that secret closed meeting. Here's a slide just telling you what it means to be uh, independent as a DSMB, and basically no member should have a basis preferring the outcome to be one or the other direction. So again, you don't want a huge amount of stock ownership in, in the company that's sponsoring it. You don't want to be a person who's enrolling your own patients in the trial, because that the second point here, you could actually influence what happens in the trial by, influent, by enrolling less sick people or whatever it is. So independence, independence, just think about what it means in a common sense way for you to be independent from what happens in this trial. We've talked about confidentiality. Um, and this is just highlighting the various ways it matters in terms of being confidential. Um, let me just raise an ethical issue here because I think this is an ongoing issue. I assume most of you at one point or another have probably encountered consent forms in clinical trials. Um, in the US, there's a common provision, I think it's fairly common around the world, that it will often tell the person, if we learn information in this trial that would be relevant to your deciding whether or not you want to stay in the trial, we're going to let you know. Think about that. This is actually a somewhat not that ethical thing to tell them because one thing we actually know if there's a DSMB, that DSMB is going to be looking at a bunch of information. It often will learn something that, hey, arm A isn't looking very good, but they're not going to stop the trial because we haven't reached a point of the appropriate statistical significance. We're not going to tell that to the subjects. And we won't tell them because we suspect if we told them in many instances, a lot of them, if they have a bad cancer or something, that's what the trial is, they're not going to stay in the trial, okay? So what we should actually be telling them is, by the way, th under the rules in which we conduct the studies, we're actually going to have some interim information from time to time that if you knew this, it very well might change your decision to be in the trial, but if we told you, we wouldn't be able to finish the trial. So that would actually be, think about it, the more ethical way for this consent form to tell you what's actually happening, because this is what, what's happening. We are intentionally hiding interim information from the subjects, and we're hiding it from them because if we told them, we would have a hard time finishing the trial. So just think about that, whether we should sort of revise consent forms. Um, 
Yeah, and this is just going through the various things the DSMB looks at. Again, it's collecting all this information, it's deciding to continue or stop the trial. Uh, what might a DSMB tell you? It could tell you to continue the protocol, don't need to make any changes, to modify it or maybe terminate it, all things we've sort of already talked about. Um, Again, a big deal, but sometimes the DSMB may recommend stopping, and these are all things I think we've come discussed. Safety, you've de demonstrated efficacy, you're not gonna be able to demonstrate anything, the trial is just not working, okay? Um, this is a complicated decision. Again, we've already discussed this. It's a really big deal to sort of stop a trial for whatever reason. Uh, lots of people, as we discussed, will get involved. You want to do a lot of thinking, a lot of thoughtful discussion. You want to run your statistics, um, but it's a complicated thing. Um, there are downsides to stopping a trial early. Um, for efficacy, and I already raised one of them, okay? You might be an issue about, well, maybe we'd actually learn something important by continuing it a little longer, like in that breast cancer trial, okay? Um, you know, again, running, doing the right statistics is sort of complicated, um, so it's, it's really an incredibly easy decision to just decide to stop a trial early. But this happens. Um, here's one example of, of a, a famous trial in which this happened. This is a phase three trial. We were, they were trying to see whether or not circumcising men would be effective in terms of uh, preventing uh, transmission of HIV. And uh, here's a trial in which uh, first um, efficacy was demonstrated in one particular trial in, in 2005. Uh, NIH DSMB recommended continuing other trials for a while, but eventually stopped those too. So again, you know, you could look these things up. Um, yeah, we have time. Okay, so I want to give you one example, because uh, this is a fairly recent thing. Actually, let me back up a little bit. Okay, so we're going to talk about hip pads. I just don't want to show you the slides. Some of you may have read it anyhow, okay? Because uh, this is a good way, maybe we could be interactive for a little bit. Uh, this is a trial I know a lot about because my office as a regulatory matter got involved in it. So let me tell you what they're trying to study. And I would encourage you, I give you a URL, you could see some details of what happened. So what it was about was about these things called hip pads. And it's actually easy to understand. So. Elderly in like nursing homes, people who are 70, 80, 90 years old, one of the worst things that could happen to them is they fall and you're old, you're kind of weak, somewhat fragile, you fall and then you break a hip because your bones are fragile. Particularly women could live longer and then their bones get even more fragile. Um, if you break a hip at a very old age, you often can die of that because you're then stuck in bed and other bad things could happen. You get infections. So one thing people have been testing for a while, and it was still unclear whether it worked, were these things called hip pads. And they're not like probably what you think. They're not these really incredibly thick things. It's like imagine you have a pair of underwear and on the side of the underwear, on the right and the left side, they have these little pads that kind of go in pockets, okay? And some of these were being used, but there were still not good randomized clinical trials demonstrating whether or not they worked. So imagine you wanted to do a trial to see whether or not this worked, okay? And you have a bunch of nursing homes well, can I ask you a question? So how might you, let's assume your first design element is you want to do the randomized trial. How would you randomize? On what group would you randomize? Anybody want to venture, particularly somebody who hasn't read any of this stuff? Um, what might be the element on which you're randomizing, okay? And if nobody wants to say anything, I'll kind of too sleepy or whatever it is. Okay, so one option could be maybe you want to randomize on each person. Some get the hip pads, okay? So, you know, half the people have hip pads and the other half don't have any hip pads at all. I mean, that's a fairly standard way to randomize, right? Uh, okay, another way you might want to randomize is we talked about clustered designs. So you might, now whether or not I'll go into the ethics of this a little bit. You could randomize by nursing home, okay? Maybe it'd be easier and a much better way to do the study if half the nursing homes put hip pads on everybody so that all the nurses would be very good at putting the hip pads on and making sure they stay on. And the other half of the nursing homes, you wouldn't have any hip pads at all. 
versus randomizing each person, you know, maybe it's a little more complicated remembering which ones are wearing the hip pads and which one aren't and whatever it is, okay? These are all two different choices. Notice there are ethical issues in terms of any of these, okay? Well, if you're going to randomize according to nursing homes, um, what kind of consent do you get? Do you get consent? I mean, if the nursing home is randomized to not using hip pads, well, what about those poor people? Maybe they want hip pads or something. Are we you know, harming them somehow, okay? So these are interesting questions. So th this all tied into the ultimate design because what they actually did in the real study, and, and just to highlight this, these were three of the top people who did geriatric medicine. One was a Harvard-affiliated researcher. One was affiliated with Washington University in St. Louis, which is a very prominent university in the U.S., and one was at University of Maryland. Uh, so what they decided, and they were thinking about the ethical issues in terms of their study design, they said, well, maybe it's unfair to like have some people have hip pads and not others. So what we'll do is, remember, you're wearing a piece of underwear and you could put the hip pads in the pockets. Let's have each person be their own controls. So they basically randomized every person to a hip pad on one side or the other side, but not both. So you could see maybe this is sort of more, more fair. Everybody's sort of getting half the benefit of hip pads, assuming the hip pads actually work, okay? So that's what they did, okay. So they're doing that study and they're starting to conduct it. And the, the interesting thing that happened was um, they start noticing that it seems to be too many people are breaking their hips, okay? You know, even though the half of them have these hip pads, they, they just seem to see too many people breaking their hips. And the other thing they're noticing, and I'll try to give you some of the statistics on this, I guess we're okay time-wise, is in particular, it seemed like people were breaking their hips on the side where the hip pad was. Now, they were like, this is really strange, okay? You got the pad, you're breaking too many hips on the padded side. And this was like very, very strange. And just to give you some sort of sense of it, I love when Paul gave you these little sort of numerical examples. Um, so what they discovered early on, for example, okay, so in one of the sites, this was in St. Louis, where Washington University is, in the first year of the study, they had 11 people okay, um, who broke hips. Not a huge number, okay. And there were actually hundreds of people in the, in the study, but of course they're not all breaking their hips every day, okay. So 11 people had broken their hips. Nine of the 11 broke their hip on the side that had the pad. Now you could, Paul gave you, the, gave you examples, you could run the number. It's like flipping the coin, okay. It would be relatively rare that, that you had out of 11 flips, nine of them would have been heads and two of them would have been tails. And I ran numbers I think it's something like one chance in 40, okay? So it'd be less than 0.05. And this was a little concerning to them. You know, gee, this sounds strange. I mean, what they really wanted was to actually demonstrate on the padded side, of course, you should almost never break a hip, and they're, they're seeing exactly the opposite. Um, and, and so they kind of started talking about it, and what you'll see in the URL, if you want to kind of look this up, is we actually ended up having quotes um, emails between the investigators discussing this and trying to figure out we have no idea why this is happening but kind of if we let the DSMB clearly know what's happening maybe they're going to shut down the study um, and, and I have some of the quotes okay so this is the, the NIA, one of the NIH people who is the program officer for the study at one point they were actually they had some hint about this, okay? And uh, not as much information as the researchers had, because these researchers were busy emailing each other and saying, well, gee, maybe, you know, maybe we could hide the statistical significance and not tell them the real numbers and everything. So at one point, here's the question the NIH person was asking at one of the DSMB meetings, do the trial data show sufficiently conclusively that the current pads have an adverse effect to warrant stopping the trial of the pads. Okay, so he's asking, we're seeing these strange results, Are we, do we have conclusive enough results to stop the trial? Which is a relevant thing. Now what other, I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer on this, what other thing would you be thinking of doing at this point? Even if you're not deciding to stop the trial, if you're seeing these kind of numbers, 
what, from an ethical viewpoint, might be a relevant thing to do. Anybody wanna, seeing anybody volunteer? Okay, um, so what you might wanna do at the least is you're gonna ask yourself, okay, what does this mean in terms of risks? Okay, does this mean that the risks of being in this trial are perhaps different than you might otherwise have thought they were? Because initially you would have thought this was a pretty low risk trial. You've, at the least you've padded one side of these people's hips and hopefully gonna reduce their likelihood of breaking that hip. And now you're seeing, and again, they had no idea. I mean, they were talking to each other, researchers. Why are we seeing these broken hips on the padded side. Uh, so you might think whatever it is, even if we don't know what's happening, it sounds like there might be some risk that we didn't identify before and maybe we should be telling the subjects and telling them, well, maybe there's an additional risk and you maybe want to decide whether or not you want to stay in this trial. And, and they didn't do that. What they ended up doing basically was saying, well, we have a, an even better pad. Let's change the trial and replace the old pad with a new pad. Now, even though they had reasons to think the new pad was better, they didn't have any reason to explain why the new pad would be better than the old pad in terms of understanding why the people seemed to be falling on the padded side. So, but what happened was they did replace the old pad with a new pad. They reconsented to people just talking about that. We got an even better pad, and we're going to continue the current study with just padding one side with the new pad. And so this is sort of what happened. And oh, so the other thing, again, this is fascinating. So as of the time all this was happening, they remember I told you they ran some of the statistics and it was statistically significant at I think about 0.0 p 0.01 value in terms of seeing a differential you know breaking hip on the padded side so it worked out that one of the researchers had actually done a pilot study he'd been funded by NIH for the pilot study before all this happened and he actually enrolled like 600 patients in that study so he's telling his colleagues gee you know, I did the pilot study, I never actually looked at this issue of which side, you know, was it the padded side or the not side? Oh, you wanna see the side, what? Yeah, I was trying to kind of hide this, but okay, whatever. Anyhow, well actually you already know all this stuff anyhow, okay. So, what this researcher did was, okay, let me go back and look at the results from the pilot study and the 600 people. And he actually ran the numbers on that. And, okay, so he got a p-value of 0 0.003. So this was a different set of data, and he was looking at the same kind of unexpected issue. And here he's seeing an even smaller p-value than before. And bottom line is, they don't actually bother telling the DSMB about this. And so I, this is just a great example of the wonder and beauty of statistics, okay? Because remember we went back to, what is it, Bradford Hill and his sort of look at common sense and, and whatever it is and don't always, you know, think you're gonna come up with a biological explanation. We're now seeing two separate sets of data with p-values on something that the researchers had no clue why this was happening, but at a certain point you should perhaps be, you know, we're scientists, let's, Trust the results that we don't know why this is happening, but something real is happening. What do you need? 0. 0.000006 before you're going to suddenly say something is happening, which is not to say you necessarily shut down the study, but what I'm encouraging you to think about is, and even the DSMB, we could debate whether they were given enough information to think about this. They certainly were aware, even with not all the p values, about this preferential falling on the padded side. Um, so in any event, they ended up conducting the whole study um, and somebody ultimately after the study was all done complained about this. It was actually weird. It was a guy who made hip pads and he thought this study was all wrong. It was done in an inappropriate way. So he actually sued the researchers and that was how he ended up getting all these various emails among the researchers. And I'd love to give credit particularly to the statistician on this study actually in the discussions with his colleagues was having all these sort of back and forth with them and they're wonderful quotes if you kind of, if you ever get to sort of read this. Um, 
Here's a quote from him to his colleagues. Based on these results, we should question whether it is ethical to continue this study design. Okay, and he was discussing what is an adverse event. I think we have to pay attention to this result that they're falling on this padded side or breaking that hip as a possible SAE, right? We already know about it, a significant adverse event, even if we did not define it this way. Again, they had no clue at the beginning something like this could happen, but he's telling them, this may be a risk to the subjects and doesn't, hopefully you could figure this out. Yeah, that sounds like something strange is happening. It might be risky. And notice the things we have to think about. Why is this happening? What is happening? Are there more falls than there would have been at all, somehow due to these hip pads? Uh, are we seeing the same number of falls we would have had, but they're falling preferentially on the padded side? And, and notice what this means even in terms of just analyzing your ultimate question. Because if in fact, instead of falling 50-50 on both sides, they're falling 75% on the padded side, 25% on the other side, it could be that the hip pads actually are working in terms of making sure the hip isn't broken. It's just that so many times they're falling on that side, you're seeing more broken hips on this side. So notice you'd actually have to design your model to figure out whether or not you are in fact proving or disproving whether the hip pads work. Um, okay, so anyhow, but these are wonderful quotes, and again, I particularly love the statistician who is trying to encourage his colleagues to be more honest with the DSMB. Uh, unfortunately, ultimately, he kind of caves to them and kind of hides the statistical significance when he talks to the DSMB. Remember, in that closed session, he'll present the unblinded data, and he sort of indicated, well, I'm not going to sort of highlight the p-value and things like that. And the DSMB didn't figure out enough of this, so it basically kind of... So the study went on, and then it got criticized, and somebody complained to our office. And ultimately, what happened, actually, and we were you know, happy about this, is the JAMA, which is the journal that had published results. It had published results way before we learned about it. It ultimately did something it had never done in its history. It published a one-page thing they called a statement of concern, that they were very troubled that they had ever published this because look at all the things that happened, including data being hidden. And, and this is just go, getting into sort of some of the examples of issues that DSMBs may be involved with and how DSMBs may sometimes have to dig a little bit in terms of we see a hint of something happening, let's ask ourselves whether or not this represents risk. Okay, so enough on that trial. Uh, we've already heard this message. All trials need monitoring. Okay, okay, so good question. What was really happening? I don't think right now they fully understand that. What the person who sued, who made these things, said was that basically what happens, because this is like tight underwear, and then when you put the pad in, it, it, it puts pressure on certain nerves. So he was saying, right, by putting a pad on one side and not the other, you are actually doing things neurologically to, and these were already, these were like 80, 90 year olds that could do enough to influence their, their you know, how they, how they move, that they would end up falling on one side as opposed to the other. And he gave some complicated analysis in terms of numbers and, and whatever it is as to how this could happen. Nobody has proven that. That is his guess. So he's basically saying they had a flawed design and of course probably nobody would have predicted this and it's unclear whether he would have predicted that in, at the beginning. It was just after all the data he was saying there was a reasonable explanation for why it's happening. But the numbers are so compelling I think you have to conclude yes something strange was happening um, and that's why it's fascinating to read. You got the published results. You got stuff from our web page about all the conversations among the researchers. It has all these statistical issues, these ethical issues. Uh, it really, I think, is a wonderful case study in terms of real DSMBs looking at real issues. Okay, so we don't always need a DS DSMB. We always, or certainly for anything, you know, that's more than minimal risk, you certainly need monitoring and some kind of plan. Um, in terms of policies and regulations out there, um, there are often not that much in terms of regulations telling you when you actually have to use, have, have to have a board. NIH does have a variety of policies. Uh, phase three trials do need a DSMB, an actual board. Um, different parts of NIH, depending on what part of NIH funds you, 
may have stricter rules in terms of even in certain phase two trials, you may need a DCMB. So the bottom line is there are lots of rules all over the place. Whoever is funding you, you better know their rules. But certainly if you're doing a phase three trial, if you're doing a trial with a lot of serious risks, this sort of thing, you probably want an actual board. You want an independent board. You don't want yourself or the people running the trial to be the ones that are making these decisions. Uh, this is just pointing out FDA has some rules, but most of those are just advisory and giving you some examples of the parts of NIH that have different types of rules. Uh, so when might you need an independent DSMB, a uh, large randomized trial with mortality or major morbidity endpoints, uh, you're looking at serious toxicity, comparing rates, trials of a new agent, a high-risk treatment. Again, these are all sort of common sense things. You certainly want a, a real DSMB in any of these trials. Um, but again, remember, any clinical research study that involves more than minimal risk to volunteers, even if it's not randomized or a clinical trial, uh, you want some kind of monitoring, okay? You always want some kind of monitoring. Uh, you may not need an independent DSMB for an early phase trial. We discussed phase one. Depending on the phase one trial, maybe you don't need one. Uh, a short-term treatment of a trial where you're relieving a common symptom, something that isn't that serious. And bottom line, if there's no ethically compelling need to monitor interim safety and efficacy, yeah, you probably don't need a board. Um, are there disadvantages to having a DSMB? Yeah, it's complicated and it's costly. I mean, you know, common sort of sense. And so if it's not ethically needed, there are other ways to do it. Uh, we already discussed there are other forms of monitoring. Uh, this is just an example of one university's rules. Uh, this is just showing IRBs and DSMBs have complementary missions, so an IRB may be, or a, what, your CEP may be evaluating a study at different points in time than the DSMB. Um, so I'm going to finish up um, with, with one final topic. Um, and this is just getting a little more detailed on a concept we already got into, interim monitoring, okay? One of the most important things that DSMB is doing is looking at the trial as it's moving forward and at various points in time saying, is everything going okay? And do we have to think about perhaps stopping the trial early? And the two biggest, or, or in terms of interim monitoring, you may be stopping a trial early just due to some bad risk, okay? Not gonna say a lot about that, but that's one of the things that DSMBs look at. Um, but the other two big things they're looking at are whether or not you've proven efficacy earlier than expected, or what we call futility. So we'll say a little bit about that. And the bottom line is, all you, you know, I expect you to get out of this are the major themes, okay? Because, again, I'm not a statistician, and the statistics of this stuff is complicated, and you really need your real statisticians to doing this. So, and, and again, these are themes we've already, we just kind of, saying in a little more detail, okay? You're, you're, in terms of efficacy, that's all we'll talk about first. The DSMB is monitoring it and is wanting to see, you know, have you proven um, efficacy earlier on than you thought you might? And what it's gonna do is it's gonna do things called looks. It's gonna unblind the data and look at various points in time. And remember, our protocols should spell this out ahead of time. You want it spelled out in the protocol, a fair amount of detail, when they're gonna look, okay? And this is where you get into the summer statistics that Laura Lee talked about, right? You're gonna, you need all this expertise about different types of survival curves and what statistic you're actually gonna look at. And now normally recall we, we, we'd want to reach the 5% statistical significance level for a lot of these trials. And, and the theme we're getting at here is that if you do more than one look, if you're not just gonna look when the trial is over, when you've run exactly the number of subjects that you expected, you're gonna to have to modify your statistics. You can't just do your Z-scores and say, have you reached a plus or minus 1.96 that would normally, normally correspond to 5%. Basically, you're gonna need a tighter p-value, something much, much less probably than 0.05. And I love the example they talk about here, because I think this is very common sense. Okay, imagine you're wanting to, to see how good somebody is in terms of throwing darts at a bullseye. See, I guess people in statistics like bullseye examples like Paul's, okay? So a person could tell you, you know, 
I just hit the bullseye, okay? Well, if they just told you, well, I've actually I've been going here every night for three hours, you know, and, at this pub and throwing these darts, and this is the first time in, in several weeks that I actually hit the bullseye, it would tell you that I, I shouldn't now assume this person is a, an expert at throwing darts, okay? Well, that's exactly what you're kind of doing. If imagine, you know, you have a trial and it's enrolling lots and lots of people every day, five or six extra people are enrolled, well, you could actually be looking every day and saying, well, are we plus or minus 1.96 in terms of our z-score today? And you may discover, you know, the 200th time you look, you did that. And well, the bottom line is, uh -uh, that doesn't work. You're not going to be at the 0.05 p-value, okay? And we actually have a little chart. Uh, oh, right, you discovered it took 485. Oh, okay, so here's a chart showing that based on the number of looks, um, the actual p-value that you'd actually be at. And you could see quickly, and this depends on if the looks are equally spaced or not, okay? There are worse ways of spacing them. But basically, see, your p-values are actually nowhere near 0.05 if you're like doing 10 looks. So again, you need different statistical analysis. Uh, oh, and this is just giving you an example of one trial in which during the trial they actually hit you know, the 1.96 value three times during the trial. And yet at the end, it ended up being about zero, okay? So they didn't reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so bottom line, you're gonna need a different type of statistics. And there are da various technical statistical methods for doing this. One called O'Brien Fleming. Um, this is the older version of how you do this. And, and this is hard to do because it requires that you pre-specify the number of looks and you need an equal number of patients being enrolled with events between the successive looks. So you could probably imagine this is not going to be real user-friendly if you kind of want to be doing stuff, okay? Um, and, and this is just commenting on how that applied to that Zidovidine study that we talked about, okay? So there are more modern, more user-friendly ways to do this, and perhaps the most common approach is what they call this spending function approach. And the great thing about the spending function approach is as if you have a pot of money, like a, an alpha value, and you could decide how much of the alpha value you want to spend on any particular look, and you could do the look sort of when you want to. So it's a lot more flexible. Uh, and it really does, you, I mean, it, it gives, you know, researchers a lot more flexibility in terms of this. Again, I'm not going to go into details of it, but be aware, this is when you talk with your statisticians about all the wonderful ways to do this. And this is just describing some of the trials that use the spending function approach. I noticed uh, just like two weeks ago, there was some study that reported results early uh, that was involving, oh, people of bad hearts, heart disease. Apparently, for the first time in like 10 or 15 years, we've discovered apparently a combination drug that was incredibly compelling, that's doing wonders in terms of people with, with badly functioning hearts doing better and getting into less heart failure. So it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, so I'm going to end up very briefly with some futility monitoring. Okay, so this is the flip side. You may discover that your study produces efficacy, you proves efficacy early on. The other thing, and this may be a little more common, you may discover your study doesn't look like it's going to prove much of anything. Um, and the point to highlight this is there are two ways in which you could have that happening. And this is noting one through four are possible examples, and number five is a little different. So one through four are just kind of that you're not having enough subjects, the subjects are dropping out. Logistical things in terms of how you conducted the study mean you're just not going to have the numbers you need to prove what you wanted to prove. Um, number five is a little different because you may have the numbers and what they may be demonstrating is the effect you were looking at just isn't real, okay? You thought the new treatment would in fact be better than, than control or placebo, whatever it is, and in fact maybe it just isn't going to be. And, and the bottom line, we have a number of slides here that sort of go into the statistical analysis of this, but the bottom line is sort of 
you have to ask yourself if number five is your issue, you have to make a decision about whether or not you want to continue to study. If one through four were your reasons, the bottom line is you just don't have enough subjects, you know, without massive superpowers in terms of suddenly enrolling massive numbers of subjects, there's no way this study is going to show anything. But if number five is the issue, you have a legitimate question to decide about whether you want to continue to study and basically, you know, with a fairly high power, demonstrate that you're not going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? And, and this basically relates to what were you studying. Um, there are some times when actually demonstrating that, again, to a high power, maybe 90% or whatever it is, um, you're not rejecting the null hypothesis is a useful piece of information as opposed to shutting the trial down early. And so let me give you an example. Um, there was a study about a, sort of a complementary medicine sort of treatment for heart disease to prevent strokes and heart attacks, namely chelation. You give drugs to strip your body of all these metals that are in it, okay? And this was a very, very controversial type of treatment. In fact, a lot of organized medicine had position papers out there around the world saying, this is horrible. If you're a patient, you should never go near this kind of treatment. It's just going to waste your time. And the worst thing we want is you not to use standard drugs for preventing heart attacks, whatever it is, or, or exercising, or not smoking, okay? So stay away from this stuff. Well, a randomized, large randomized trial was conducted, okay? And this is not what happened, but let's assume you're doing the analysis, and you're doing this futility analysis, and it looks like there's almost zero chance you're ever going to demonstrate that you should reject a null hypothesis. But you still may want to keep enrolling people and reach a point where with a high power you could state that you know we're 90 percent confident that there isn't any benefit from this chelation therapy because you want to go out to the public and say we just did this big trial and see this stuff doesn't work so again that's going to depend on what your study is for a pharma study they may often want, love to shut down the study early because they're spending millions of dollars and it does them no good to, to even more compellingly demonstrate that their drug is, is useless. That's not something they're going to do. But if there's a benefit from showing the, you know, the null hypothesis is valid, um, then you may want to do that. Um, and that's, there are several slides that basically do that, but, but show this with statistical speak in terms of conditional power and unconditional power. Um, and probably, again, you guys don't have to know that, but this is the way statisticians would speak about this and basically say that point. So just be aware, just because your trial isn't going to demonstrate something, you have to decide. Is it not demonstrating it just because we don't have enough subjects and that sort of thing? Or is it just that the actual effect of what we're studying may not be there? And is it in our interest to continue the trial to the very, very end? And I think that's probably it in terms of the slides. Uh, Okay. Oh, and, and so this is a great quote, which uh, is, is quite compelling. Um, so no single, single statistical decision rule or procedure can take the place of well-reasoned consideration of all aspects of the data, which I think both Paul and Laura Lee have emphasized. It's, it's often not about just one number. You want to look at what's happening, okay? Go back to Bradford Hill. Lots of things you want to look at in terms of if your trial makes sense, if you want to continue it, if there are too many risks. So a lot of it is very trial specific, but never lose common sense. Do we actually want to have a conclusion that actually compellingly tells us this stuff, you know, doesn't work? And there may be times you want to show that, and there may be times you don't. Um, so this is the last slide. Uh, we may have like three minutes or two minutes for questions. Thank you. And so we, this afternoon we will we'll talk about CEPs and I'll give you a, a, a case study which I think is interesting on how to get you to think about CEPs and informed consent. Okay, uh, in case you have a study sample to have 300 participants. Yeah. And we, and then, we may need Laura Lee or Paul to answer this, because I'm not the statistician, but okay. go ahead. And then uh, you perform an interim analysis with uh, 60 participants, and you find a difference, but not with that p-value as 0, 0, 0, 0006. And can you reverse the math 
to calculate maybe the power of the study to that number of patients and then decide to stop or not the study based on a minimal power value? Yeah, I think our statisticians are going to have to answer this one. I, I'm not going to take too much time. I, also, I want to hear Laura Lee's, uh, but it, it, in my mind, it doesn't work. You know, you, you, you plan up front and you decide what is the right alpha, the right whatever, all the parameters up front. And then once you have what you see, then that's it. But again, emphasizing that's just one, one component of the big picture. So, so two things, one is two points. One is the planning of what you want to do has to be done up front, not you do it and then you calculate what's the power and reverse and all that, that's number one. And number two, even with that, keep in mind, and I'm just repeating what, what uh, Jerry was saying, keeping in mind that that's one component of the picture. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, I don't want to back calculate other things. You can look at conditional and unconditional power. Jerry nicely skipped over those slides. But that's actually controversial to do that. And you have to weigh the information. There's a lot of information you have to take into account. But usually, yeah, you set things up up front. You have to really think about it and think about all the possible reasons and, and it is still, when you make a decision, it is taking into account not just the analyses, but a lot of other information. Like sometimes I stop studies because of adverse event rates. It has nothing to do with the primary efficacy, although other times I continue going for other reasons. So there is kind of a big, a big swath of information that has to be evaluated. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm.